Uh, in terms of quietness, we are filming, so we ask you all to be quiet. Uh, if you want to re-watch the debate or share it with a friend, we are putting it up on our YouTube channel either tonight or tomorrow morning, uh, which you can find online. And in a minute, I'm going to start do a countdown to start the production. All right. Everyone quiet. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, Hello and welcome to the Bath Studio School Big Debate. We're very fortunate to live in a democracy and enjoy the benefits of a free press. That means we can hold politicians to account and really quiz those people who want to be our elected representatives. And don't underestimate how important politics is. It governs every part of our life, our education, our work and in many ways our home life too. In 2015, the election is going to be a really exciting one. No one party is coming out as really strong at the moment, and UKIP is throwing a real spanner in the works of conventional politics, and that all means there really is everything to play for. It's really exciting that tonight, prospective parliamentary candidates are putting themselves forward, ready for some tough questioning from the students at the Bath Studio School, who are not only presenting, but producing and crewing this entire production they're demonstrating their skills as the media professionals of the future, but also voicing their concerns as the voters of the future, something which I hope the PPCs take seriously. It promises to be a great programme. Hello and welcome to the big debate held here at the Bath Studio School. Tonight in this production, every role in the studio is being filled by one of my fellow students. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Sammy Lowcock. We have Alfie Bamwell in the audience ready to take some burning questions from some of our pupils. And I'm Toby Sprague. We as students are bringing up the important issues that need answering. Here we have with us the prospective parliamentary candidates for Bath and surrounding areas. It's very exciting to have all these parties in one place as the BBC aren't currently including the Booming Party in their debates. The first part of the debate is to give each candidate two minutes to explain why they should be Bath's MP. Joining us tonight to answer all our questions from the Conservative Party, Ben Howlett. For the Liberal Democrats, Steve Bradley. From the Labour Party, Ollie Middleton. For the Green Party, Dominic Tristram. And finally for UKIP, Julian Deverell. We'd like to bring Ben Howler up to uh, do his two-minute talk on how he wants to be back in. Thank you. I love Bath. It's one of the best cities anywhere in the world. And for me, I'm really proud to call this city my home too. Whether it's the independent small shops that are in our city or whether or not it's our beautiful heritage, our history and our culture, I love this city so much. And I think it can actually get even better over the next, um, over the next five years and the next 30 years as well with a long-term plan. I'm going to level with you. It's going to be some big shoes in order to fill with Don Foster, our current MP, standing down. And it's incredibly important that we continue on that work of serving the, rep uh, serving the people and the constituents of Bath as well in the best way possible to stand up for young people in particular as we stand here at the studio school tonight. But it's also about setting a plan. It's having a vision for what this city is all about and how we sell that plan to you as well. For me, I was selected by uh, local residents, by uh, constituents. Uh, when they selected me, they backed my six-point plan for Bath. It's a long-term vision of how we can solve some of the major problems in this city, whether or not that be our transport problem. We know how difficult it is to get from one side of the city to the other when we're trying to get to school or trying to get to work, and we need to be sorting out those problems, or whether or not it's about the lack of affordable homes in this city, or in particular, as we're here at the studio school, where we've got an amazing talent pool of young people who are really passionate about creative industries. 
I want to see over the next 30 years a real platform for them to be able to stay in Bath so that when you are able to leave your apprenticeship, whether or not you leave university or further education, you have a job, you have a reason to be in Bath and you can help this city grow. As I said, the plan is really paramount to what I'm doing at the moment and hopefully what you'll see over the next hour is some really important points as to how we can deliver that plan as well. And uh, for me, this is an amazing city and I really want to continue to make it an amazing city city too. So I look Thank forward to speaking to you later. Thank, Thank you very much, very ben. much ben. And Steve, would you like to come up? Thank you, Toby and Sammy. Um, Bath is without doubt one of the most beautiful cities in the world and somewhere I am proud to have been called home for 10 years. But it's also a city at a crossroads. There is much to celebrate here. Unemployment is low. Our schools, like where we are today, are considered excellent. And we've got the biggest building boom since Georgian times about to begin. 9,000 new jobs, and over 3,000 new homes. But our city also faces challenges. We've got pockets of deprivation and inequality, parts of our city where life expectancy differs uh, by 10 years from one end to the other. Our people work in a low wage economy, house prices are nine times the average salary, and our streets are clogged with congestion at peak times. How we address these issues now will determine the type of city we leave for future generations. Looking forward 20 or 30 years' time, what kind of city do we want Bath to be? Will it be one where our young people can receive a quality education, find a good job and make a home for themselves? Or are we in danger of becoming a place only for the wealthy? Where young people on low wages are condemned to a life of renting, where key workers are condemned to a life of commuting, and where family homes are out of the reach of most families? Which paths will take us where we want our city to go? and who is the vision, the experience, and the ability to help guide us on that journey. I see the role of an MP as being more than just representation, though that's very important. For me, the role of an MP is also about leading the debate on what kind of place we want our city to be. I'm proud of the work the Liberal Democrats have been doing locally and nationally to improve life for everybody in Bath, and it would be an honour to have the chance to deliver even more as our city's next MP. So over the next hour, I will outline my ideas on how we can tackle the challenges our city and our country face. I hope to show the pride I have in Bath, my passion for determining the best way forward for our future, and the skills and experience that I believe make me the best choice to help guide us there. Thank you very much. Because Steve. I believe working together, we can all make our city and country a better place. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Thank Toby. You. Ollie, if you'd like to go Stay up. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me along this evening. Um, so why should I be MP for Bath? Well, before answering that question, I want to tell you a little bit about myself and how I've ended up here today talking to you guys. I first got actively involved in politics around three years ago, and um, I've got two parties here to thank for that, um, because it was living under this Tory Lib Dem coalition that I was prompted to get involved. And I was fed up. I was fed up with seeing young people being hit with the trebling of tuition fees, after they were told that tuition fees would be completely abolished. I was fed up with looking forward to a future, a future that involved our generation facing the prospect of being worse off than our parents. I was fed up with seeing the NHS dismantled before our eyes. But I soon realised it didn't have to be this way. The Labour Party offered an alternative. They offered young people a future where we could succeed and thrive. They offer a vision of a country where the economy works for everyone and not just a privileged few at the top. A country where a fair day's work means a fair day's pay for a living wage. And what better way to fight for our NHS than to fight for the party that created our NHS? I realised things just had to change and the Labour Party offered a vehicle for change. Now I'm proud to be fighting for the change in the city where I've grown up, the city that I love, the city I'm passionate about, the city where I'm standing to be MP. But people in Bath have been let down. In 2010, thousands of people in this city tactically voted for the Liberal Democrats to keep the Tories out. It simply hasn't worked. Bath was betrayed by the Liberal Democrats, and Bath deserves better. I want to demonstrate to you today that it doesn't have to be this way. There is an alternative. There is a chance for things to change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ollie. Dominic, if you'd like to make your way up to the podium. 
When I moved to Bath 15 years ago, I didn't want to be a politician. I was, or I've always been interested in issues. I've been members of NGOs, Greenpeace and Oxfam. I've worked against poverty and I've worked for environmental causes. But the more I looked at it, the more I realised that actually politics is an intrinsic part of that. And to ignore politics and political parties is to ignore a huge chunk of, of, of action that you can take through the ballot box. Now, I took a very neutral view of which party most reflected my views. And I came up with the Green Party. Why is that? Well, the Green Party is basically run by people. There is a big difference when all of us here today will talk about what we think and, and what we're going to do. Every party here, other than ours, is funded by large donors, whether they're individuals or unions or other organisations. We are not. As such, our policies reflect what people actually want rather than what our rich donors have dictated. Now, how is that reflected in what we actually say? Well, we're the only party that's advocating renationalisation of the railways. We're the only party that wants to scrap tuition fees for university completely. These resonate with the public. They, in fact, the vast majority of people agree with these policies, but yet we're the only party that is putting them forward. Our independence from money men and other companies and organisations mean that we can speak for what people actually want rather than what they've been told to want by the media. As an MP, I might not be part of a government, but I will be a good backbench MP. We're not a whipped party. I'll be able to vote for whatever my constituents want me to vote for. And you have to remember, with a whipped party like some of the other ones here, they have to do what their le leaders say. That's, is that democ democratic, or are you better with somebody who will actually do what's best for you? I'll fi finish by saying our one MP at the moment is just one MP of the year. Just think, one MP we've got won that award from all of the MPs in Parliament. If we had a few more MPs in Parliament, we'd be speaking up for people rather than corporations, fighting for a public NHS and ending this accepted route of privatisation and the rich getting richer. Thank you, Thank you Dominic. Yeah. Julian, last week. Thank you. Good evening. Now, the reason we're here tonight is because in a few months' time, there's a very important vote taking place, isn't there? And I've got a question that I'd like all of you to consider. If you wake up the morning after the general election next year, you turn on your television set, and the result is another combination of the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats, the Conservatives, do you really believe that that's going to make any positive difference to your life or to this country? Let's take this evening as an example. For years, the political candidates in Bath have been wheeled out like they have this evening to answer your questions. And I've no doubt whatsoever that the career politicians among us have prepared some fantastic answers. And they're certainly going to have some brilliant ideas about how they're going to fix all of Bath's problems. Now, if we'd been stood here ten, five years ago, sorry, Don Foster would have looked you all in the eye and told you how he planned to vote to scrap or lower tuition fees. We all know what happened. He voted to raise them. So those of you that do choose to go to university, when you leave, there's a chance that you'll have more unsecured debt than your parents paid for your first house. This is why a UKIP government would scrap tuition fees for certain core subjects, such as technology, the sciences, maths, engineering. And I'm here this evening to represent the alternative in British politics. And I plan to represent the city in a new and refreshing way. And this is a way that our career politicians just haven't heard of. And that's with honesty and integrity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. I'd now like to invite the first question to the candidates. Uh, given that there was a huge rise in num vote numbers in Scotland after they allowed 16-year-olds to vote in the Scottish referendum, do you believe that 16-year-olds in England should be allowed to vote? I'd like to invite the Lib Dems to start, the, start us off. A very short answer is yes. My party has a long-standing policy. It was in our 2010 manifesto that 16-year-olds should be given the vote. For us, it's part of a process of re-engaging people with democracy but it's only part of that process, and there's a whole raft of other measures, some of which we've tried to bring forward, some of which have been blocked by the other main parties. The form of the voting system, so everybody's vote counts, and we get rid of safe seats for any political, political party. Reform of the House of Lords, so we get rid of a system where privilege buys you a seat at the table in government, 
by an appointment and where big donors get rewarded for that. A cap on political donations so that we have a much fairer and level playing field between all the parties and we take big money out of big decisions. There are a few examples of what I think needs to change to improve democracy in this country. And I would absolutely put folks for 16 year olds at the heart of that. It's our party's policy. It's something we're very keen to deliver. Thank you very much. Ben, would you like to follow up on that? Sure. My view has changed on this, actually. I was looking for an example of where um, the vote turnout would be larger as a result of the Scottish referendum. And at the Scottish referendum, we saw turnout amongst 16-year-olds to 24-year-olds uh, being incredibly high. Uh, the reason why many in the Conservative Party were saying, no, we disagree with votes at 16, is because the turnout uh, between 18 to 24 was so low. Um, as ever a pragmatist as I am, looking at what happened in Scotland, the inspiration or the debate that engaged young people in that uh, discussion, I think could actually be uh, replicated here by introducing votes at 16. So um, you get quite um, chastised in politics for making a U-turn, but I'm quite happy to make a U-turn on this based on the evidence that has been provided as a result in Scotland. And hopefully all the political parties here and all the young people here as well can get far more involved in the next general election. I don't think that's necessarily going to mean because you have votes at 16, the turnouts are going to be huge, but all the political parties now need to be looking at providing a very, very good um, policy and manifesto for young people over the next five years. Thank you very much, Ben. Julian, can we move on to you? I think the, uh, the situation in Scotland was really interesting because people had something very definitive to vote for. You know, there was a clear distinction between yes and no. And I think we do have a, uh, a problem um, whereby uh, you know, young people have become disenfranchised with politics, and you know, whether it's 16 to 18 year olds or you know, 18 to 24 year olds. And uh, I think that um, there are, you know, I think we need to look at the reasons why people have become so disenfranchised. I think, you know, like I was saying earlier, um, when people look at the three main parties, that's the choice they've essentially had over the years. And, and they do sit down and think, well, what, what difference is this going to make? And I think it's really important that we do re-engage with the, the younger generation. My own view is that votes, lowering the voting age to 16 is something we shouldn't do, um, which is not going to be uh, you know, a popular viewpoint this evening, um, but it's honest. But I think that it's, there's a lot more proactive steps we could take to re-engage young people with politics. Okay, thank you. Ollie, would you like to follow up? Um, well, quite simply, yes, I do. Um, this is why uh, votes at 16 is something that's going to uh, play an integral part in the Labour Party's manifesto in 2015. Um, and I think there are a variety of reasons why votes at 16 are such a great thing. Um, it's in line with other civil liberties. You know, you can go and fight for our country at 16. I think it's crazy that anyone suggests that you can fight for a country, but yet, oh no, you, you can't have a say in who runs our country and who's actually telling you where to go and fight. Um, it all seems slightly ridiculous. Um, but there are other arguments as well, and we talked about uh, re-engaging young people, and, and, uh, and people point to Scotland as, as being an example of where um, young people uh, really are engaged in politics, and that the voter turnout reflected that. Um, it, it did to a large extent, but I, I don't think um, we should kid ourselves. You know, the problem um, with apathy, particularly affecting young people, is not over yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think the thing is with Scotland particularly, the vote was legally binding. That played a massive difference. Um, it was a very simple question, either yes or no. That also played a massive part. Um, we've got to work a lot harder to engage young people in politics. You know, as, as a young person myself, I should know better than anyone. Of course, you were 16 yourself. Not too long ago. So uh, not not that long ago at all. Were you interested in the vote um, when you were 16? I I was I, I've always maintained an interest in politics. Mm -hmm. um, I, I haven't uh, I wasn't involved in party politics at that point. Um, but you know I've, I'm massively in favour of um, politics being integrated into the curriculum at secondary school age. I mean I think we should be teaching politics from year seven to year eleven, and then if students choose to take that as an option at sixth form, um, they can do that. Um, uh, we've got to be making sure we're educating our young people as course, well. Yeah. Lovely. Right, I'm going to move on to Dominic. Uh, in summary, yes, uh, we think there should be votes for 16-year-olds. Um, as other people here have said, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sad thing that actually more young people aren't engaged with politics because it does affect them. Um, I would say actually the 16- and 17-year-old vote is a small part of reform that's required. There are a large number of 18- to 24-year-olds who don't vote, and they have the right to vote. Um, that's not to say that young people shouldn't, but we should engage all of these young people. And it's easy, you know, you, you come across people on the doorstep who say, 
Um, oh, politics, is, politics isn't for me. I'm not interested in it. Uh, what's in it for young people? And you have to say to them, the reason a lot of po political um, lots of laws and you know, regulations and politics in general come out catering more for the older people than the younger people is because more older people vote. You know, the, the vast majority, certainly of members of political parties, but most voters are actually an older age. And actually the most active people are retired people. So you see the situation we have now where the government protects pensions but hammers the, the benefits and, and rights of, of the younger people. You know, and they're talking about scrapping housing benefit for anyone under 21. And you think the reason they can do that is because the people under 21 aren't voting. If those people did vote and if they engaged and joined political parties and get interested in the process, actually the world would go much more their exactly. way. Right. Yeah. I'd like to go over to Alfie in the audience who has a question for the audience. David Cameron said in regard to austerity, um, we're all in it together. I'm here with Sam, a sorry, Max, a student from uh, the Bath Studio School, and he's got a question for the candidates. A study, <coughs> sorry, a study featured in the Bath Chronicle recently that said that one out of five, which is 20% of young people in Bath, is living in poverty. I would like to know what each of your parties would intend to do about that figure. Um, so, Ben, can we start with you, please? What are your thoughts? The figures were frankly appalling and uh, we've been overlooking these sort of issues for a very long period of time in Bath. Um, there are a number of unsung heroes in Bath in charities which I've been working with over the last few, uh, over the last year and over the last few months in particular on this, that have been really trying to address this issue. Um, because this spiral of decline, this sort of underclass is in Bath, but a lot of us forget about it because we see, you know, loads of people off London, gets off the train, they see the uh, World Heritage Site status and they don't remember what's actually going on outside the historic core. But we know what it's like because we're out there knocking on doors and helping in the community centres here as well and uh, it is challenging. For me and the reason why I got involved in politics was this sense of a, a spiral of decline that every single political party, that is the Conservatives, Liberal Democrats, Labour, have been overlooking for a long period of time which is that none of them are willing to actually address the fact that even the good times, one million people at any one stage are solely reliant on the state. Now for people like myself who grew up in a household where my mother's disabled, you know, those people who do have disability issues in a household or are vulnerable are suffering heavily. And sorry, I do get part of political here, and that's why one of the key reasons why I'm very upset with this council, this Liberal Democrat run council, is because they're making huge cuts to vulnerable people. Early years education, for example, being a key one in areas of child poverty. Um, our Liberal Democrat candidate shakes his head, but that is true. That we need to be addressing this head on. Sorry, Ben, I'm going to have to stop there. Uh, Julian, can we hear from you? Well, I think I, I remember reading this article in the Chronicle, and I thought it was you know, very surprising, actually, to see the 20%, because obviously when you come to Bath, you are presented with a, with a huge amount of wealth when you get off the train. You, know, you see three million pound houses. And uh, we get out and do a lot of our campaigning in some of the areas that the Chronicle described as being, um, as being deprived areas. And when you speak to people there, they feel completely and utterly left behind by a political class who they've become completely disconnected from. And I think it's very, very important that, that these people are listened to. You know, a lot of them don't vote. They're not interested in politics. Um, but you know, fundamentally, we need to offer economic opportunities for these people to have employment and you know, have jobs, etc., etc. And uh, I think in, you know, in Bath, it is a, really, you know, it is a real sore point that we have such extremes of, of wealth and then deprivation in the same, uh, in the same city. Thank you, Julian. Uh, Ollie, from you, please. Um, well, I mean, I think the statistics in the Chronicle were absolutely shocking. Um, and we have a massive problem with inequality nationally. It's something Ed Miliband's talked a lot about. In fact, only in a speech the other day, it played a central role. Um, but the reality is that inequality, and in turn poverty, particularly child poverty, which is a symptom of inequality, has increased under this government. We've seen a 300, um, thou we've seen 300,000 uh, more children in poverty as a result, and uh, one of the fundamental reasons for that has been put down to uh, the changes to benefits. Um, but not only that, but we've actually got to realise that a lot of these people that are living in poverty are actually in work. We now have more people in work living below the poverty line than living above the poverty line. And it, it, you see what I mean? There's yeah. more people below the poverty line actually in work. And if we look at social security spending, 60% of social security recipients are actually 
in work as well. And, and how are we going to tackle inequality? Well, I only see um, one way. It's through making sure that a fair day's um, work equals a fair day's pay. That's why we said we're going to raise the minimum wage to eight pounds. Um, we're going to build 200,000 houses a year by the year 2020 to make sure that people have secure homes to live in and make sure that we're not paying out thousands and thousands of pounds to private landlords. Um, and, and that's ultimately how we're going to tackle inequality. That's how we're going to create a fairer society where we don't have to read the Chronicle and look at statistics like we have one in five children in Bath living in poverty. Can I just, sorry, can I just interject there? I mean, you know, one of the things that always gets me is, as Ollie says, a lot of these people are working um, on low wages. Why are they still paying tax? You know, even under the current system, um, they're, still being, they're still being charged income tax and national insurance. And uh, you know, UKIP yeah. have made a clear policy, and it's been our policy for a long time, to not to not charge people any tax on the minimum wage. Well, so I, I don't know. I don't know if that's actually true. I mean, just to point out, actually, a lot of these people are earning so little they don't they don't pay any tax at all, and that's why um, tax receipts under this government have been so low, and that's been one of the reasons the deficits actually increase and borrowings increase as well. Let's grab Dominic. Let's get Dominic's opinion on this matter. It's as simple as this: any government that signed up to austerity or any opposition party is prolonging this problem. Austerity means cutting money for the poor. That's what it means. There's no ifs, no buts. Everyone on this panel, apart from the Green Party, is committed to austerity of some sort, whether it's in the short term or the long term. What's the solution? Well, we propose a living wage where everyone, regardless of any circumstances, gets enough money to live on, allocated by the government, as is, straight away. All the dithering around taxes and things, it's just messing around the edges of a fundamental problem. Everyone should have enough money to live. No child should be poor. If you give enough money to somebody to live, they will be, they will live. They won't be poor. Yeah. It's simple. Now the money is there. Other parties here have proposed things like cutting inheritance tax and cutting income tax, cutting taxes for the richest. The money is there. That money should not be cut from the richest. It should be given to the people who are queuing up food Sorry, banks. Sorry, I've got to move on. Uh, Steve, please begin. Uh, yeah, thanks, Alfie. Um, two points I'd like to make on this. Firstly, a very brief one. I mean, the, the figures were absolutely shocking, and I mentioned in my, my opening speech, but we do have national levels of deprivation in pockets of Bath, and we need to always remember that it's a city that looks on the surface to be very wealthy. But two points within that. Firstly, in terms of how this is measured, um, the child, children in poverty is taken as a measure of being in households which earn 60% or less than the median average wage. Now, for example, we've done some very positive things in government. The Lib Dems have increased pension, real pension rises for the first time uh, in, in, in quite a significant period of time. That pushed the medium income up and therefore statistically said that there were more children in poverty, even though it hadn't affected the actual position of those individuals. Yeah. So it's important to look at what we're actually measuring. But on the more substantive point itself, I mean, it, very short, I believe the answer to get more people out of poverty is greater opportunity. And the Lib Dems, especially for young people, especially for children, are the party of opportunity. If you look at what we've delivered in government, there's now uh, a certain amount of childcare provided for free to all children aged three and four years old and to 40% of under twos. We brought in 2.5 billion funding for the pupil premium, which is targeted money, which goes towards the most uh, people from the most disadvantaged backgrounds to ensure they get extra support at school, because we believe that your chances in life are hardwired at a very early stage. We've brought in more apprentices than, than, than for decades in this country. 1.8 million apprentices have been created, opportunities for people who don't want to go to university. For those who do, do want to go to university, we now have more young people in university, we have more people from disadvantaged backgrounds in university than ever before. And finally, on income tax, I'm afraid uh, Julian was absolutely wrong. Uh, because of the Liberal Democrats in government, and it was in our manifesto, it was one of our four core policies, we've taken the lowest paid people out of tax. Now, from April, you will not pay tax on your first £10,500. We've been very clear that we want to take it up to £12,500 so nobody on minimum wage will pay any income tax at all because all we do is take it off them and just give it straight back mm, to you. You obviously again. acknowledge that at the moment the minimum wage does attract tax. And, and today you voted against the minimum wage, Steve. Your party voted against uh, an increase in the minimum wage. You know, I, I commend what you did in terms of raising the threshold. Um, but I believe it needs to go higher I, and quicker. We've guys, been very sorry, clear. We're, we're going to have to move on. Can I respond to those at all? Um, we, yeah, very yeah, briefly, yeah, we've, very we've, we've been very clear that, our, that where we want to get to is to have people on minimum wage out of taxation. If we had a majority Liberal Democrat government, rather than one where we only have 8% of MPs, we would be there already. But I didn't hear any other party in 2010 talking about taking the lowest paid out of income tax. We said we'd apart do it, UK. and we've delivered it. <laughs> apart from UK voice. We've delivered it. Right, okay, thank you. 
true. Um, immigration is the word on everyone's lips this election. A recent report by University College London stated that EU migrants contributed £20 billion to the UK economy between 2001 and 2011. This weekend, John Major said in an interview that we wouldn't have a national health service without migrants. We would not have a transport system without migrants. Do you believe immigration benefits the United Kingdom? And we're going to start with Julian. Yes. Um, the UK has always benefited from, um, from immigration. But referring to the report you mentioned, there were some, some glaring errors. You know, this report was put together by the same person that advised the government that um, 13 or 15,000 immigrants would come from Eastern Europe, um, and the number was closer to a million. There was also a bit of a mathematical error where he um, factored in that all the self-employed immigrants would be paying business rates, um, which was a, you know, a glaring mistake. So the report itself has got a lot of holes in it. And um, you know, one of the figures that, uh, that, we're that we often quote in UKIP is that net migration at the moment is running at uh, just shy of around a quarter of a million. And you know, from the dawn of time, we've always had immigrants in this country. And UKIP's policy is that we simply control immigration. Um, we're not anti-immigration, we just feel it needs to be controlled. Mark Reckless the today was suggesting that immigrants should be deported, EU mm, immigrants should yeah, be deported. Yeah, I, I, I did see that on the news, and uh, it's never been UKIP policy to... Well, it policy. doesn't sound particularly pro great policy, just, no, so you no, can the, the, You find it comfortable, you're <laughs> uncomfortable if you're on the bus with you, <laughs> No, I'm not uncomfortable. <laughs> no, Dominic, um, I'm not uncomfortable um, at all. Um, and uh, the, uh, the situation, the, the things that Mark Reckless said today, um, I believe that he was you know, slightly misunderstood. He's been running a very, a very long campaign. It's never, ever been a UKIP policy to repatriate immigrants. And you know, that is just a myth. Well, no, he, a myth he did say that we should be sympathetic to people that have a family and have lived in a home mm, for over if you, five if, years. Can I just so, interrupt? It's actually Ollie's chance to speak now, so can you, you can say But uh, I mean, I, I think it was quite clear what Mark Reckless said. Um, and you know, to, to say that UKIP are pro-immigration in any way, um, to me, just, just seems absurd. But the fact is immigration has been a great thing for our country, socially, culturally, but most importantly economically, and the, the UCL um, report concluded that. Um, but you know what? We are prepared to have a debate on immigration, but we're going to have a debate based on facts, not a debate based on scaremongering, the type of scaremongering that we, we've seen from UKIP um, over the last few years, particularly the type of scaremongering that we're seeing taking place in Rochester and Strood as, as we speak. You know, we'll, we'll have a, 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 well, a lot of that but it has to be based on facts. A lot of facts. that scaremongering has been coming from the Conservatives in Rochester. Well, uh, you're right. The, <laughs> the Conservatives <laughs> are running scared of UKIP. You Absolutely. Know, David Absolutely. Cameron. But, but your own, David your own Cameron, leader, your own leader well, Ed Miliband. Well, has, has, ben, ben, what do you think yeah, about ben. that? Well, to be honest with you, every single party under the sun, knowing what's happening in Bath in particular, is um, looking at UKIP and understanding how we end up countering them. So it's not just the Conservatives, it's also Labour, don't forget, in Hayward and Middleton in their recent by-election, UKIP came a very close second in a, in a shock result, so you shouldn't forget that. But um, it's one thing commenting on what Julian has said, it's very interesting to see when UKIP is tackled on a very difficult policy that then becomes a little bit unpopular in the national press, or very unpopular in the national press, it swiftly gets dropped. Now, as someone who's worked with the NHS now for six years, I know how much immigration has benefited the NHS. I know how beneficial immigration has been to keep some of our low-skilled jobs uh, uh, around because, let's be frank, uh, a, number, a large number of UK citizens weren't wishing to take those jobs. So we need to be looking at the reasons why that is the case. But going back to the question that you were saying earlier on, and the reason why John Major said what he did, and John Major it doesn't often say many things, but when he does, it's absolutely intrinsically um, looked at and thought, oh, actually, he's got a very good point here, is that we've been darting around the subject of immigration for a very long period of time in that there is no way that immigration in this country can be lowered unless there is a reform of the European Union. And the only way that there can be a reform of the European Union is if you end up backing a Conservative government that will introduce a referendum on that. And that is the only way you can do it. Any other vote for any other political party will not deliver you one, because the Liberal Democrats have voted against my friend James Wharton's bill in the House of Commons. The Labour Party did exactly the same thing, and both their Lords did too. And to be frank, UKIP won't have enough MPs to form a government, even if they would like to think they can. There, they there's, can't. There, there, are, there is a reason let's why... Let, why let's let, let's let, 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 let,
Do I believe immigration benefits the United Kingdom? Absolutely, and the evidence shows that. Um, at the same time, I think it's important to acknowledge that there are, are some people, some individuals and some sections of society who feel that immigration hasn't benefited them and who feel left behind by it. Um, last Thursday, to an audience uh, just a little bit older than, than, than your colleagues here, I debated along with Jacob Rees-Mogg, who's a very, uh, very antiquated Conservative MP for North East Somerset, the area around Bath where some of you may live. And it was on the motion, this House believes Britain should leave the EU. And two things stood out for me in that debate. First one, I was massively heartened by how open-minded and pro-European the audience of young people were. By a majority of about four to one, they voted in favour of the argument I gave for staying in and making Europe work, rather than pulling up the drawbridge and leaving. And secondly, what also was very important, and, and uh, I noticed, was how thin a lot of the arguments about not being in Europe and against immigration are when you challenge them head on. Very briefly, I think this country's been an open mind for a long time. I think it's one of its real strengths and it's part of why we're so powerful economically. And there's three reasons why I think Europe is important and immigration is a byproduct of that. It's for jobs and immigration helps in that to a certain extent for security and also for the environment. But I think it would be a huge step backwards if this country pulled the duvet of isolationism over itself, pulled the curtains, locked the door and forgot about the rest of Europe. Thanks, can, I, can I just make one last, last point yeah. on the Please. issue of yeah. a referendum? No, we're not prepared to commit to a referendum because we're not prepared to ignore the advice of businesses and business leaders, such as the head of the CBI, <coughs> who repeatedly has told David Cameron the CBI that, is that offering, offering, offering a referendum is not the right thing for this country. It's not in the best interest of you guys. It's not in the best interest of anyone. That's why we're not offering the referendum. Can I ask a question on that? When is a good time? Because for the last 40 years, even my mother wasn't able to vote on this issue. The European Union has transformed itself into a state that no one ever thought would I'm have been possible. Really, well, we, we, we did. We're we we the only part of two days. Yes, um, immigration people often use as a as a, some sort of threat to us. Oh, Green Party immigration, um, you know, don't, aren't you pro-immigration? And actually, yes, we are. We're the only party that doesn't pander to UKIP's sort of rightward slant Not when true. it comes to um, true, to immigration. Everyone else is talking about immigration in a kind of we're going to restrict it. Uh, Labour were just today right. saying they're going to introduce more border guards. It's, it's all they might not be saying they'll restrict immigration, but they are talking about it in UKIP's terms. Now UKIP have been successful. I'm not going to take it away from them. They've been successful in shifting the debate to something they feel strongly about. Our feeling is actually immigration, as has been proved recently by this study, has benefited the country. And unemployment slow. The government can't have it both ways. They can't talk about immigration being a problem and then trumpet this great lower unemployment they have. Every single one of us here interacts with somebody from Europe on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's a bus driver or in a hospital or something. I'm a governor of the RUH, the big hospital in Bath, and I know how important immigration is to running the NHS. It can't be stopped. Europe, the European Union is a force for good. We have, to we have to engage with it. Our MEPs, in fact, our South West MEP, Molly Scott Cato, has just been nominated for Parliamentarian of the Year for work in the European Parliament. That's just one MEP we have. Think how if we have more. You've got to engage. To disengage from it means you get all the bad bits. You can't control the sort of immigration we get. You've got to engage with it. You've got to be constructive. We do need these people. It's good for our people to go and work abroad. It works both ways. I don't want any party telling me I can't go and live and work in Europe which is what will happen if we tell people they can't do that here. And let's not forget, we have a massive number of British people living abroad. We have the same number of British people living abroad as we do immigrants here in the UK. Um, and I think to me that, that says... That doesn't yeah, can can I'm sorry, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Yeah, but thank you, that has been a very lively question. <laughs> thank you for that. Next up, we have a video package run and produced by the very students of our school. This outlines the concerns that some of the students have about Bath, and we'd like to take your take on it. These are some concerns of the young people at our school. I'm concerned about housing being too expensive in Bath for people our age, and I think traffic needs to be sorted out. I feel that the people in charge of Bath are more concerned with pleasing the, the tourists than they are of looking after their own constituents. I'm concerned about Bath's pollution level and how high it is. I'm concerned about the amount of homeless people living in Bath. I'm concerned about the crime rates in Bath. My issue is the possible privatisation of schools around the UK, and especially in Bath, when 20% of children live in poverty. I'm concerned about the seagulls and the litter in Bath. I'm concerned about food prices in Bath. I'm concerned about the cost of travel in and out of Bath, especially for students. Watching that video, uh, I'd like to bring forth your 
response to these concerns. So we're going to go from Julian, we're going to go along the line. So Julian would like to start us off. One of the issues that we heard over and over and over again there was transport. And <coughs> uh, I think uh, whenever we get these debates together in Bath, the subject of transport very often comes up. And uh, the reason for that is because for the last 10 or 15 years, we've had a local council who have failed us on transport. And um, uh, very recently, in the last few days in fact, they voted in their, uh, their new transport strategy. And uh, it's interesting to note that the Conservative Council has also backed that same strategy. And um, you know, effectively what they've been doing for the last 10 or 15 years has been failing. And this strategy basically prescribes more of that, but in a higher dosage. And um, we're not just focusing on the transport. Are there any other, any other? Well, certainly, issues certainly with the other issues. You know, obviously housing is one in Bath. Um, it's one that's very dear to my heart because I'm, um, my wife and I, are trying to buy a house in Bath at the moment, and we have been for a very long time, and it's uh, extremely difficult. And um, you know, it's we do find ourselves in a situation where young people, especially can't aspire to the same thing that their parents did. No. And that's the situation we find ourselves in all over the UK. And you know, the cost of housing is a, is a really serious issue. A lot of the people that I went to school with, for example, don't live here. I don't see them anymore because they can't afford to live in Bath. And um, so it's, uh, you know, it's certainly something that needs to be addressed. But again, there's no easy solution to the housing problem in Bath. I'm sure these guys are going to give you a silver bullet sort of fantastic thing that you'll want to vote for. In fact, we're going to move on to Dominic now. So we're going to one minute each so that we can keep it quick. To be quick, um, problems, require, problems like this require radical solutions. Mm -hmm. um, our citizens' income will end homelessness. Um, our tra transport problems in Bath, I, have, I don't say this often, but I have sympathy for the council. They're hamstrung by a pro-car government. We need a government to change the law that will actually just make driving the less desirable option at the moment, it's uh, public transport's run for profit. We don't agree with that. Municipal bus services would be much more strategic. Nobody's talking about these things apart from us. We need strategic investment of public money. We can't depend on the private sector to do this, because as everyone knows, knows here, in Bath it costs £4.20 to get to town. You know, it's ridiculous. Of course people drive. Um, housing, end right to buy, it's a ridiculous policy. Build more council housing. Um, land value tax to make sure that empty properties are properly taxed. Rent controls. These are the sort of things we have to do, and anyone who isn't advocating them is just not taking the problem seriously. Lovely. Thank you. Molly? Well, I disagree. On the subject of housing, there is a simple solution. We build more houses, and that's what we've said we'll do. By 2020, we're going to build 200,000 houses a year, which will undoubtedly have a positive effect upon the market here in Bath. Um, but now to turn my attention to transport. Well, as someone that's grown up in Bath, um, when I was selected as the parliamentary candidate for the Labour Party, I wanted to make sure I pushed transport um, to the forefront of my campaign. It's been a massive issue for me personally. It's a massive, massive issue for young people particularly. I'm sure you, all of you guys will agree. But this council um, in particular has failed to address the transport issues that Bath is facing and has been facing for a number of years. Steve will undoubtedly mention the council's transport strategy. Well, it's a transport strategy that's based around walking. You know, you couldn't make it up. It, it actually has very little mention of, of of other forms of transport at all, particularly buses, um, which are, are, are a massive problem for people, particularly the affordability, the lack of efficiency. That's why we said we're going to we're going to give councils the power to reduce fares, and we're also going to integrate transport I across the UK. Steve, now and have a look at it. Yeah, two particular um, topics I want to pick up on there: transport and housing. Um, uh, but interestingly, both of them have was at, at their roots the fact that we we in the city have had a Conservative council and, and previously a Conservative MP who basically ducked a lot of big decisions. On that was transport, years, that was years ago. On transport, uh, I shall explain. On transport, there's a number of things You've we need. Steve, 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 Steve talk. On, on transport, there's, there's three big things. That, as was mentioned, the Liberal Democrat Council has brought forward a transport strategy. It's the first transport strategy this city has had since the 60s. I'm, I'm afraid Ollie is simply wrong. I've had this debate with him on Twitter. If you look at the transport strategy, there's two pages on walking, just as there are two pages on every other element of transport. You can all look at a public available document. Please do, and, and don't let o o Ollie tell you otherwise. Okay, and I think I mean, ben, a council official I have there. I'd like to get Ben's. I have actually addressed the, the specific <laughs> points themselves. For yes, example, okay. three things we need on transport. We need a relief road <laughs> to take away the through traffic, especially at the huge lorries to the east of Bath. That's something that the last time we had a Tory MP, he stopped that and he did it for a small number of Conservative that. voters. We need uh, a park and rail project to park the east rail. of the city, which will give us huge scale to take thousands of vehicles off, off this, our city streets. We have that in our strategy. It's the first strategy this council has had to deal with transport since the 60s. If elected as MP, I will go out Thank and fight for the money to well. deliver it. Your last point okay, as well. Thank you, Lovely. Ben. Ben. 
I would say if Steve's lived here for 10 years, that he probably needs to do his homework because there have been five transport strategies in the last 10 years yeah. in Bath. Each one of those has been shelved and uh, they have each one of them been subject to political footballing between the two political parties. So I'm very proud of the fact that Conservatives are working with the Liberal Democrats in order to tow this into line because, to be frank, the transport strategy that was initiated, there was two versions. The first transport strategy that was brought out a couple of months ago if I'd taken it to the bank, I would have been laughed out of it because it was that poor. The second one is a very good starting block and there are some very good um, policies going forwards there in that transport strategy, but it needs meat on its bones. So whoever takes control of the council next time around, whether it's Conservative or Liberal Democrat, will need to continue on that. And that was one of my biggest fears, that it would become another political football. On top of that as well, I've got a three-pronged transport strategy which I would like to see introduced myself and I would be happy to uh, lobby for that if I became the MP and I'm already currently lobbying for that, hence I bought rail Railway Minister, after Transport Minister, I had a meeting with the Secretary of State for Transport in order to bring more investment into Bath. That includes uh, a 836-46 link road over in the east of Bath uh, so that we end up with, as I have already done, an really economic plan for that and I've pitched the Chancellor of the Exchequer about introducing an economic feasibility study for that and I can announce that tonight. Second of all, you will also see uh, a new East of Bath park and ride from day one of the Conservatives taking over the Council. There are seven sites set out in the Halcro report which was introduced by both councils by the way, the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats in the last ten years. It's it's Google it. and yeah, that is a transport point, yeah. strategy. There will be one introduced there too. And in addition to that as well, I'm a great fan of some of the stuff that the Greens are doing because as much as the Liberal Democrats would like to say in the last 10 years that they've been doing an awful lot of work on reducing air pollution levels, I don't think they've gone far enough. And if I remember correctly, that was a Liberal Democrat MP here for the last 23 years. Integrated, uh, sorry, but a Secret Transport Cabinet member. Sec Segregated cycle paths in Bath are an absolute must because, as we all know, as okay, people who are cyclists, we need to be making sure question. that people are getting on their bikes safely. Thank you. I'd like to hand over to Alfie with another question from the audience. After 44 years with the UK as part of the EU, it now looks likelier than ever that we may at some point in the future choose to leave, even though the government estimates that 3.5 million jobs in Britain are linked directly or indirectly to the UK's trade with other members, member states. I'm here with Sam, who is a student here as well, um, who studies at the Bath Studio School, and he's got a question for the candidates. Do you believe that we are stronger as part of the EU? Um, so for that, I'm going to start off with Ollie. Um, absolutely not. And as I said before, that's why we're simply not, at this point, offering a referendum, because it's not in the country's best interest. The EU offers us a whole host of benefits, um, none more so than economically. And that's why the head of the CBI, as I pointed out before, has come out and said, any, as, as well as cutting immigration, has said the thought of Britain outside of the EU or a Britain outside of you would have a devastating effect upon our economy nationally. It would cost jobs across the country, as you said, millions of jobs are on the line. It would cost jobs in the southwest, and it would cost jobs in Bath. That's why we're not uh, we're not committing to a referendum, and that's why I firmly believe that Britain is better as part of the European Union. Thank you, uh, Dominic. Um, we are committed to a, a uh, referendum on the EU. Um, what we don't want is a referendum on Cameron's renegotiated with the EU. What that means is Cameron is trying to negotiate us out of all the worker protections <coughs> and uh, other rights that you have as an employer, as an employee, in favour of the co of the companies that employ you. This is the general approach of the Tories and UKIP, and that when they complain about red tape and bureaucracy, it's your protections, it's your holiday pay, it's your sick pay, it's your maternity pay. Now, we are not, as a party, corporatists. We believe in actually. The decisions that are most should be taken at the most relevant level. Some decisions have to be taken at the European level. So environmental protection, it wouldn't make much sense if just Britain decided to do something about banning some pesticide. That has to be done at a European level. Um, what we want to do is remove a lot of the free marketism from the EU and make it something that works for people rather than corporations. TTIP, which everyone else here, their parties agree with, we absolutely oppose TTIP. It takes <coughs> decisions from national governments and allows corporations to sue. If the national government does something like keep the NHS public, this is wrong. We've got to reform the EU. The only way to reform it is to stay in it. Thank you, uh, Dominic. You, Steve, you're actually shaking your head there. I'm going to come to you next. Yeah, well, I, I want to go on to the broader issue rather than get uh, sidetracked with a specific example. Uh, as I mentioned previously, I think there's three reasons why we're better off staying in the EU. And as an aside, I would say that not everything is rosy in the EU yeah. garden. We, we, I think we have to be honest about that. But I think we can make it work better for Britain 
by staying within, not by going away, lifting the drawbridge, shutting the door and closing the curtains. The three ways in which I think it's good for this country are in jobs, uh, for example on trade deals, uh, trade deals on the South Korea where in the space of two years our trade doubled from 2.2 billion to 4.6 billion in only two years. That's creating jobs and opportunity for people like you in this audience. Um, it's also important for inward investment. Our car industry was on its knees in the 60s and the 70s. Thanks to inward investment, because we're a bridging post to get into the EU market, Nissan, Honda, other companies have spent a huge amount of money creating and helping skills here, providing more opportunity for people like, like, like yourselves in the audience. And finally, trade within Europe as well. It's the largest market, the most, uh, the most valuable market on the country, uh, sorry, on the planet, 500 million people, huge opportunities for our companies. But it's also important for security, two particular reasons. Um, crime does not respect national boundaries. Um, criminals will, will, will do trade wherever they can. So for us to chop our boundaries up and to only have crime fighting tools which stop the boundaries doesn't make sense. There's a European arrest warrant which has had some huge success for the UK. Sorry, it brought back one of the July 2005 bombers. Unfortunately, the Tories want to scrap it. Um, and finally, on environment. Again, climate yeah. change does not respect Sorry, borders. Thanks, Thank you. Uh, ben. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the European arrest warrant, so not all the Tories want to scrap it again. <laughs> so in terms of this question, for the last 30 years, we've been promised by successive governments that being a part of the European Union means we're able to reform the European Union from the inside out. Now, that only washes up to a particular point. So we've got to a situation where now um, some of the political parties here are saying the uh, question that's being asked is either a yes or a no. Well, it's not. It's an in, out, or shake it all about, okay? And for me, it's really about the shake it all about bit, not having any credibility at the moment. We do not know what we are trying to negotiate in my mind uh, and for a lot of the public as well. So what I have said to the Prime Minister myself uh, and I've said it to him a number of times that you need to be very clear with the public before the general election what you are going to try and renegotiate. For goodness sakes we're at the best position that we ever have been in decades in order to renegotiate. We are at the moment growing faster than the European Union. We have got a stronger hand than we never had before. If we leave it another five, ten years, then the Eurozone is likely sorted out its problems. Well, I hope it does anyway. And it's going to then be very, more, uh, very much more difficult to end up renegotiating. I would like to see the Prime Minister lay his cards on the table beforehand so that we can have a proper debate, because we haven't had a proper debate. Right. If I ask anyone in this room now if they knew all the facts and figures about what the pros and the cons are about the European Union, unless you went away and spent a couple of days researching it, trust me, no one has. So actually, we could end up putting a very positive case together about the renegotiations are in the interests of the United Kingdom, we will stay in the, United, uh, we will stay in the European Union. If it is not in the interest of the United Kingdom, quite clearly, in my view, we should pull out. But I hope, for goodness sakes, that we end up being able to renegotiate and that the European Union listens to the needs of the British economy. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Julian. I course. think it's, <coughs> it's awfully interesting, isn't it, to listen to all this posturing from these, uh, from these politicians about the European issue. And uh, you know, if we touch, for example, on the subject of trade, you know, for the last nine years, I've run a business that has traded with the rest of the world, and uh, most of my supply chain comes from Europe. And um, you know, I think a lot of things that politicians miss is that trade isn't something that governments do. You know, trade is something that takes place between companies, and it's ultimately driven by you, the consumer. You know, the reason that Volkswagen sell cars here is because ultimately you want to drive one. And um, you know, as a nation, we've been trading successfully for hundreds of years. And you know, why do we need a political union in order to trade? And I think some of the language used is also very interesting, because people talk about being pro-Europe and anti-Europe. And I, of course, am pro-Europe. You know, my business depends on Europe. And um, it's the distinction that has to be made is between the European Union and Europe. So you know, in UKIP, we're very pro-Europe. We're very anti-European Union. Thank you. OK, so the NHS is a beloved institution currently undergoing a massive reform, which many characterise as the beginnings of privatisation. I know a few of you have briefly touched on it, but how would you go about protecting the NHS? And I'm going to start with Labour. Um, well, as I said in my little two-minute speech, um, one of the reasons I made the decision to join the Labour Party, the kind of be involved in politics, is because of my experience with the NHS and looking at what was happening to it. Um, and the NHS is in crisis. It's as simple as that. We're seeing more and more of the NHS being privatised every single day, thanks to Tory and Lib Dem uh, legislation. 
Um, we're also seeing waiting times up. We're seeing ambulances waiting outside hospitals for longer than half an hour. Um, we're seeing people not being able to get GP appointments. Um, absolutely terrible things happening. And how do we rescue the NHS? Well, we don't cut its funding for a start, which is what's happened under this government. In, the re in real terms, funding has decreased, despite what David Cameron said, and that's, that's backed up by the National Statistics you touched Authority. touched on patient waiting that's times. How would you do that? How would well, you cut down pa patient waiting times? For one, we'd, we'd invest £2.5 billion pounds a year, um, which would <coughs> fund 20,000 extra nurses, uh, 5,000 extra case workers, and 8,000 more GPs. So, and, and ultimately, that's how you get waiting times okay. down. But we'll also fundamentally put an end to the privatisation of the NHS. Well, and it, was make your, sure it was your government who introduced the PFI. You had the NHS for 13 years, and you introduced the PFIs. And at the end of that 13 years, we didn't turn around the, and look at the National Health Service. There's a distinct Sorry, difference. Can we negotiate between between terms, please? Um, yeah, I'm a, I've had real close experience of the NHS recently, and it's enabled me to see both what's, what's fantastic about it and ways in which it needs to improve. My sister in the last week had a bone marrow transplant for leukaemia. Um, and I've, I've been very busy in Bath, so she's in Manchester. The few times I have had the chance to go and see her, it's been, it's been really helpful to, to have a look at the facilities in the hospital and to, chat to, and to chat to her, my sister, about her experience, and also to all the staff there. Um, a couple of things I would say. Um, firstly, the NHS has had problems of various sorts for decades, and it's a big, complex system. We need to be honest. You know, there's been debates about the NHS for as long as anybody can remember. Secondly, I think what's important, and the situation my sister really drove this home, I think we need to forget about dogma and focus on the quality of care and ensuring that it's free at the point of access for those who need it most. Because if we get ourselves tied up on who, what type of, of label should be on the service, um, we could end up having worse quality services for individuals. And I think people like yourselves, your families, your friends, when you're in need of healthcare, what's important is that it's there, it's free at the point of access, and it's good quality. Okay. So that's, I'd rather we focus on that rather than any particular dogma. Of course. Okay, thank you. And Dominic Green Party. Um, I'm sure Steve would like to focus on that because always be aware of the phrase free at the point of access. That is not the same as not privatising. It, since this government came in, we've gone, to, to Labour's credit, we've gone from a system where actually it was recognised as one of the best and most efficient healthcare systems in the world to spending billions on an ideological uh, privatisation project, which Labour Cameron lied about before the last election. <coughs> no top down reorganisation of the NHS. First, and at the time, he knew that they planned the biggest reorganisation of the NHS in its history, purely because all of the private healthcare donors to the Tory and the Lib Dem parties have paid their way into this. And what's happened since? 70% of new contracts have gone to private companies. We've ended up with Virgin running childcare services. We've, who knows who's running what service? All these cancer services going out to centre. The basic truth is prof, private companies make a profit from the healthcare. That's profit that's going to shareholders, not on patient care. Now, we've seen this again and again. Private health, public health care is the most efficient. Of course it is. Everyone, that money, even if it's, you could argue it's not being spent in the most wise way, but actually at least it's going to the patients. Now, it's been proved, a circle who've been handed um, Hitchinbrook Hospital um, have basically failed to run it better okay, than the sorry, we're going to, let's go to Ben, Very sure. please. Mm, um, on Hitchinbrook, by the way, the Care Quality Commission has shown that it's actually far outperforming some of the previous uh, facilities that were run by the NHS, just as an update, because that's probably about four years out of date. And in addition to that, Ollie, you'll know that, uh, well, I hope you know anyway, there's something called the Lord Darcy reforms, which were introduced in the Labour government that actually split commissioning organisations away from private uh, uh, organisations. When we left government, the NHS was running at le level satisfactory. And it's interesting, Ben's the, defending sorry, private health care. Is he saying private health care is better than the NHS? No, no, I was saying, in terms of the facts that are available to us, Hingingbrook has now actually turned the corner, is actually doing a much better service than it was under the NHS. So for me, and the reasons why I'm a, proud of the NHS, but also concerned about its long term, is that people like my mum who've relied on the NHS, and I completely empathise with Steve on this, because you and I both had quite close uh, issues with the NHS recently, um, is that in 30 years' time, are people like my mum, people like Steve's sister, going to say receive the same quality of care in 30 years time as they are today. And in my mind, it's not. A 2.5 billion pound spend on the NHS to plug a 30 billion pound black hole by 2020, to me, says that there is still no real answers being provided by any of the political parties at the moment in terms of being able to fund that gap. 
yes, the reorganisation has done what we should be doing, which is to actually empower GPs. And my brother's the first one as a doctor to tell me, trust you, Ben, uh, I'm a doctor, you're not. I know how, what the NHS is all about, and you don't as a politician. That's true. So I'm glad about that side. But until the argument comes down to, you've got two options to fill that £30 billion pound black hole. Either your taxes are going to have to go up, or we're going to have to find money from other sources. You as the taxpayers, you as the British public, should be offered that argument is the day that we will end up trying to solve the problem that hasn't been fixed since the days of um, the uh, Bevan report when it was first set up. Okay. It was never sorry, supposed sorry, to be like that. Can we, can we have government though, Ben? Oh, the sorry, NHS, Ollie, as Ollie, I said, Ollie, 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 can we please Ollie, please yeah. Well, I think it's true. It, again, yet again, it's awfully interesting because you know, for years we've had politicians from the three main parties sort of arguing and debating over the NHS like some sort of political football. And, uh, you know, and as members of the public, we've sort of seen it get progressively um, more problematic. And at our uh, conference recently, um, you know, UKIP outlined our policies for the NHS. And um, you know, they include obviously keeping it free at the point of need, because I think there's nobody that won't, um, you know, that won't uh, support that. And um, I think that you know, our, our NHS does suffer serious, serious problems. And um, there's no point in looking at it as such a sacred cow that we can't address those problems. And you know, one of the things that we look into is inefficiencies. And uh, you know, one example of that, for example, is staffing costs in relation to the amount of agency staff. You know, we've done some research, and you know, in some cases, uh, hospitals are paying sort of hundreds of pounds per day for agency staff, um, sometimes £100,000 a year for a job that would only um, normally be you know around thirty or forty thousand, and you know I'm sure and Ben knows all about this because he's worked in the recruitment um, for NHS staff, and uh, you know he knows probably a lot better than I do how that recruitment process. Just a little works. thing on the UKIP policy of mm. recruitment. You says you you're going to reduce the numbers of people that can't speak full English. Well, in increase in the NHS. like you have to speak English to a certain level. To a certain level. Yeah, yeah. How would you enforce that? Well, in terms of the exact details of how that would be enforced, I don't know. But um, you know, I think certainly having you know within the NHS people who are providing a service, um, being able to speak a common language, I think is a good common sense idea. Okay, thank you. Well, it, look, there's no getting away from it. UKIP are in favour of privatisation of no, the NHS. Not. There's no, a video of Nigel Farage saying he favours an insurance-based model. You're right. Of there, there is a video. Well, I'm right. There, there, there is a video. There's, there's your evidence. Two, two, two years ago, can, can, can I just address, back address back the video? So Nigel Farage suddenly changed his mind. That video. Has Nigel Farage suddenly changed his mind then? That video was made two years ago, and since then, UKIP has engaged in some That video was made two years ago, and since then, UKIP has engaged in something that, that your party could frankly learn from, which is called internal debate. And over that two years, we've been growing as a party, we've debated as a party, and we've formed an NHS policy that if you look at now, you will find, find it extremely difficult to pick holes in it. And it's, you know, it's, it's just what we expect from the three main parties, going back through old video footage of members of our it was party. It two years speaking. ago. It's not okay. Okay. Just, just, just as a quick one. Right, okay. So Labour are saying that we do not believe in privatisation of the NHS. So at the moment, as we speak, there's something called the Foundation Trust Network Conference, which is going on. It's an NHS management uh, conference. Uh, all chief executives are coming from across the whole of the UK, from private sector organisations as well as NHS organisations. One of the first meetings that was held uh, at Foundation Trust Conference was, funnily enough, Andy Burnham going along a meeting with Virgin Care. So, you know, as much as Labour would like to say that they're going to stop the privatisation of the NHS, we are going to stop the what they're not the going to end up doing is reversing all the contracts that have been uh, issued since Labour ended up introducing the Lord Darcy review back prior to the previous election, and then say to everyone, right, the NHS is now going to run the NHS again. It's not going to be the case that that happens. It's a false economy. And it is a lie to the British public. Focus in on solving the black hole in the NHS public spend, and that isn't a party political uh, warning to all of us, that's a countrywide warning to all of us. We should be working together on solving this problem. So not for the latest NHS review, the the latest review endorsed our plans for the NHS. Of course, okay. so that's, okay. I'm afraid that's not really true. Sorry, it's really sorry, we do have to move on. Okay, so the last question again from Alfie. As students, the prospect of rising university tuition fees is a major concern for all of us. Sam here in the audience has another question. Yeah, if the United Kingdom really is united, then shouldn't tuition fees be the same on both sides of the border? So for this question, we're going to start with Julian. 
Yes, well, obviously, in my opening speech, I brought up the subject of tuition fees because it is a bit of a sore point in Bath due to, um, due to Don Foster's uh, promises and the promise of the Liberal Democrats. And uh, my personal view is that in the introduction of tuition fees was a, uh, a regressive step. And, uh, and it does put us in the, you know, a situation whereby people do leave university with huge, huge unsecured debts. And, uh, and there was actually a report um, by the, um, the Education Commission that came out uh, very, very recently that looked at the impact of tuition fees. And what they're saying is that some people won't pay these off till their 40s or 50s. Under the new um, guidelines that the government have introduced for mortgage lending, they'll find it impossible to get a mortgage. So the, you know, the, the, the things that our parents would have aspired to, such as owning a house, a car, having a family, things that were considered the basics, you know, these tuition fees are really, really making it extremely difficult for young people. And I think that you know, reducing and removing fees um, is something that, you know, that, that has to be looked at. Thank you, Julian. Uh, we're going to move on to Dominic and work our way through that. Um, I think it's true to say that we're the only party here who uh, will abolish tuition fees entirely. Um, I think education is a right, and it shouldn't just be for work. Education is a way to be a rounded person. Um, one should never use personal anecdotes, but, it, but I, since I left university, I was at university a long time, and I didn't pay for it. I did a, a, a degree and a PhD, didn't pay for any of it. It was brilliant. And everyone should have that opportunity. And when I came to Bath and I started working, I enrolled in OU courses, and, which I did for my own personal development. This isn't, wasn't for work. This wasn't dictated by corporate sort of life. It's a way of being a rounded person. And it's a brilliant thing, the Open University. And what's this government done? Now, that sort of thing's unaffordable for me, let alone people who actually haven't got a degree and need that to get on. And why was the OU made to ch pay these, uh, to charge these fees? To put it in line with the other universities. It was a purely kind of vindictive move almost to make sure there's no cheap route to getting a degree. Now, I don't think people should be priced out of education. I think education should be available to anyone, regardless of means. And it should not be a consideration when, when you're a young person deciding whether or not to go to university to think, do I want to be able to get a mortgage? Do I want this 30 or 40,000 pounds worth of debt? You should do it if you have the ability to do it. Can I just interject? Well, one, of, one of the really interesting things in the report was that it's, they calculated that if uh, university tuition fees were reduced from 9,000 back to 6,000 pounds, the cost to the Treasury would be about 1.7 billion. And, uh, and I just thought, oh, 1.7 billion, you know, that figure rings a bell, doesn't it? Um, that's how much the European Union were asking us for a couple of weeks ago to prop up the failing economies over in Europe. And so, um, you know, the sort of priorities of the spending seem absolutely ludicrous. Right, thank you. Um, well, I think uh, it was absolutely um, disgraceful when the Lib Dems toured the country, Don Foster did it in Bath as Steve will know, and told students that if they get into power, they get into government, they'll abolish tuition fees. In fact, they've, they've trebled them, as you guys know. Um, as a result, I personally happen to face leaving university with over £50,000 worth of debt. Um, but. There are other factors in this as well. Um, the reality is, this does not deliver, this is not a policy that delivers value for the taxpayer. Um, the vast majority of students are not going to be able um, to pay these fees back. Um, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest, but we're far better on the, the, the previous system in, in terms of, um, and universities are now. Your um, government, introduced, massive government, your government subsidies. introduced them. Um, but we are, we are in favour of a reduction in tuition fees. And in long term, um, we're also looking at the viability of a graduate tax, which I think is a brilliant alternative um, to fees and still allows us to maintain the world-class standard of, of education that we enjoy in this country. Um, and I think that's really important. Thank you, Ollie. Uh, Steve. Thank you, Alfie. Three points I would make on this. Firstly, it's important to look at why we have tuition fees different in Scotland than we do in the rest of the United Kingdom. And the simple answer is, the Liberal Democrats. The very first coalition in Scotland was a Labour and Liberal Democrat coalition, despite Labour having introduced tuition fees into the country in the first place. We negotiated that people in Scotland wouldn't pay tuition fees because that was our party policy, which it still is now. Takes me on to the second point. When we got into government with the Conservatives in 2010, with only 8% of the MPs, we couldn't unfortunately negotiate the same deal. The Conservatives just would not budge, and Labour also were Why in favour of just them. Just, 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 just a few up on that. Of tuition fees. No, can I continue? We weren't in favour of that. We're not in favour of that. Let's see, continue. You've had two questions. Big difference. So, so what, the fo our, what our focus has been on instead is ensuring that the system is about fairness, because 
what we're trying to do through tuition fees is ensure that people can access education regardless of the wealth of their background and their parents. So if you look at the statistics now, we have more young people going to university than ever before. We have more people from disadvantaged backgrounds going to university than ever before. We have more people from ethnic minority backgrounds going to university before. And the reason why is they have all basically looked, sat down and looked at the cost of going to, to university. I have a, 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 an image here with me which shows you, uh, if I can take it out, that basically the amount you pay on a monthly basis on the new scheme is less than it was on the previous scheme of labour. And the final point I'd like to make is about double standards. Firstly, it's labour who brought in paid for education, scrapped free education, which at the time I campaigned against as the president of Bath University Students' Union. Secondly, Ollie, in his opening speech, said one of the reasons he got into politics was because he was annoyed at a government which trebled tuition fees. In 2001, Labour's manifesto, I have the copy here, on page 20, Sorry, so you may you remember that guy, it said that Labour would not increase tuition fees and it legislated to stop it. Yet three years I later, I think it says a lot about Steve's yet party's three years record in government. He's having to quote manifesto. Yet yeah, three years later, three years later, Labour trebled <laughs> tuition fees. That's exactly what Ollie said. He's unhappy about any other. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Let's move to double standards. Uh, it is unfair, and it's grating on a lot of people in uh, England, in particular, to see that above uh, the border, because of devolution, uh, and we've skipped across the fact that there's actually devolution in Scotland, they were able to set their own tuition fees and uh, make them. Free. Now, for me, what I would like to see is a reform to uh, England's uh, powers so that England and Wales has uh, an equal ability to set its own higher education rates of uh, fees so that we don't end up having to therefore subsidise Scottish free education when we're having to pay £9,000. So I think there's a huge amount of work we need to be doing to reform that. Does that mean therefore I'm in favour of English votes or English MPs? Absolutely I do believe that and I think that's something really important that as a proper Democrat that we actually end up uh, working working towards in the in the short term. On relation to tuition fee levels, I would be very surprised if any party will end up being able to afford to reduce tuition fees at the next election. I think, to be honest with you, the amount of lies that have been going backwards and forwards over this issue with false petitions, false pledges, etc. Um, I think most parties have to be very, very honest with uh, students in particular uh, before the next election uh, because frankly they're probably going to end up having to backtrack on that promise knowing the economic difficulties that we're currently in. Although Germany have just scrapped tuition fees. Can so I just, it's possible. Can I just interject? Well, one more, yeah. one more interjection. So can I just interject? Interject. In, relation to, in relation to Steve's point, blaming the Conservatives as to why the Liberal Democrats had to drop the, um, the, their pledge, I sort of preempted this situation. There's this article um, in the Guardian, um, which has found documents, it was printed in 2010 actually, um, which found documents within the Liberal Democrats um, suggesting that they planned it before the coalition had even been formed. And it was a pledge that they got together and agreed okay. that they would. Uh, and of course, if, yes, sort of if, if I can just respond, respond to that, I mean, we, we've shown where we could introduce tuition fees, we did. That is, this, that, that is absolutely the reason why Scotland does not have tuition fees, but the rest of the country does. And what was very interesting to then add insult to the rest of the country, when it came to the vote to treble tuition fees under Labour in 2004, the vote was very close, and they only got it through with the support of Scottish MPs. So Scottish MPs ensured that English students pay tuition fees uh -huh. when their own... Thank you very much, Thank you very much, Stephen. Now to wrap up the show, we're going to have a one-minute sum-up from each of the candidates that were today. So I'm going to start off with Ben, if you'd like to come up to the podium. One minute sum up. Mm. No, uh, thank you very much for organising today's debate as well. It's been incredibly interesting to listen to young people with their views and also to hear from all the different candidates here. But one thing I'm absolutely passionate about is this city, as I said earlier on, but also about taking the city to the next level over the next 30 years and to set a really positive agenda whereby you as young people who ended up leaving this absolutely amazing school can feel confident that you can come back to Bath if you finish off at university or you've got a job, um, that there are enough jobs of available for you as well. So hopefully all of us today will take this away and listen to the reasons why we should be building creative industries across Bath and investing in that because you guys, when I was going through my comprehensive school background, I would have itched to be behind those cameras. So I would, hopefully you'll end up being able to do exactly the same thing in Bath by getting involved in that creative industry sector in the future. So if I do become your MP, it's certainly high up on my agenda. I'm proud to be a governor of this school and I really do wish you the best of success in the future too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ben. Steve. Uh, thank you, Toby. Um, 
as I mentioned at the beginning, I mean, our beautiful, historical and welcoming city faces a number of challenges, and we've touched on some of them this evening. And they're stopping it from becoming an even better place. On transport, on housing, on our economy and on the environment, there are challenges which are holding our city back. And there are practical solutions available for most of them. Now, I've outlined this evening just a couple in between the melee of solutions that I offer as a Liberal Democrat on the key issues we face here. I'm passionate about ensuring that Britain combines a stronger economy with a fairer society so we can enable everybody to get on in life. I will fight to make our planet a more equal, a more peaceful and a more sustainable place. And I'm determined to help make Bath the home of opportunity for all, not just a city for the wealthy. I hope I've also shown uh, that I have the experience, the leadership and certainly the passion to help deliver change for the better here. So if you want someone as your next MP who shares your passion and your hopes for the future of our city, I hope you can all work with me and support me to become Bath's next MP. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, obviously, you've heard a variety of different arguments from all the parties here today. Um, but it's quite simple. Next year, in May um, 2015, some of you guys will be voting, some of you won't. You'll know people are voting, though. And people in Bath face a choice. A choice between the two coalition parties who have repeatedly hit the most vulnerable, poorest in our society, whilst only standing up for a privileged few. The party that has fueled the crisis for an INHS a party that is only prepared to, uh, the only, vi only vision for the future is for those at the top. We see it differently. If you want an NHS that remains in public hands, an NHS that you can all rely on in your hour of need, a society that works for everyone, a positive future for young people like yourselves, there's only one option, and that's Labour. Thank you. Thank you, Ollie. Dominic. You've heard from politicians today. Politicians have a certain way of thinking. Your choice at the next election is clear. There are effectively four Conservatives with different coloured ties. They are wedded to Thatcherism and the society we've had since the mid 80s where there's an increasing inequality between the rich and the poor and, uh, not th and no real reason to tackle, no impetus behind tackling things that are important to us all like climate change. I have, I, if you choose me as your MP, I will fight for these things. I will fight inequality. I'm not beholden to corporate interests. I'll do what the people say. We'll scrap tuition fees. We'll make the NHS public. These are commitments. These are something that no other party is saying. It's a clear choice. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. And lastly, Julian. Well, I'd like to thank all of you for putting this event on. And I think it's been awfully interesting, hasn't it, to, uh, to listen to the posturing of politicians this evening. and. Um, one of the things that we haven't mentioned that I feel as though I must do is that we are living through um, politically one of the most interesting eras that we've had for an awfully long time. In a uh, little over 24 hours, the polls will be closing for another UKIP by-election, which we will probably win. And uh, this election is certainly going to be the most exciting that we've seen in a very long time. And I would urge all of you as young people to really embrace the fact that for years politics has been boring. You know, the same old, same old, same old lies, same old broken promises. But this time it's going to be really, really interesting. And I look forward to seeing all of you again through these very interesting times. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. I would like to say uh, thank you very much to the audience, actually. Uh, you've been a huge part of... Um, this debate and I think it's really important that we get an opinion from the people themselves as they're the people who are going to have to live with these big changes. Um, I also think that, um, sorry, that's it really. Oh, oh. Thank you to all our candidates for taking part in this debate. I believe the response to our issues has been useful and this has allowed us to get involved with local politics. It has definitely given us an insight into how future issues will be solved. I'd like to thank everyone again for coming and participating. This has been quite the experience and I think we've all learned a lot. I hope whoever becomes Bath's MP can keep their word. From us at the Bath Studio School, thank you for watching.